Honourable Members, I'm about to uh, call on the Honourable Sheila Mills to uh, give her inaugural speech. Uh, before I do so, I remind you that uh, it is her inaugural speech, and as such, um, uh, there should be no interjections. Uh, the Honourable Sheila Mills. Mr President, I would like to congratulate you on your election to the High Office of President of the Legislative Council. I would also like to congratulate the election and re-election of members of this House and His Excellency the Governor for his address. I also congratulate the Honourable Bob Carr on his 10th year today as Labor Premier of New South Wales. Mr President, I was born in Wales. Most of my family still live there. They are proud working-class people, real working-class people, not the redefined Peter Costello variety. One grandfather worked down the coal mines and the other worked in the brick factory. My father was a strong man. He had no privilege in upbringing, but through sheer determination became a computer scientist after being a pilot in the Fleet Air Army in World War II. It was always my father's belief that education was the key to social and economic emancipation. His view was that he did better than his father and it was my mission in life to do better than him. Thus he spent a large amount of his time and energy to making sure that I achieved, not only at the academic level, which was his priority, but also in sport and music. I used to play a pretty mean tenor saxophone and was quite a handy timpani player. I look forward to joining the Honourable Sally Talbot in a jam session one day. The one piece I would like to play would be the triumphal march from Verdi's Aida. No one in my family ever stayed at school beyond 15 years old. Further education was not an option, even if they had the ability and aspirations. I was the first person in my family to go to university such as my father's determination that I succeed. I attended the University of Wales. The day that I was scheduled to attend for the first time provided a caravan of family members winding their way down from North Wales to Swansea. It was during my grammar school days that my political op opinion started to take a firmer shape. This was ably assisted by the headmistress of the school, Miss Dean, who told me that people like me did not go to university. My background was obviously not privileged enough. Universities were the province of the well-off and the privileged. Nevertheless, I gained offers from five universities, including Durham and Liverpool. However, I chose the University of Wales. That I was able to take up the offer was thanks to Harold Wilson and the then Labor government, who through a system of grants and means testing made it possible. I do, do not know if my father ever saw the irony in this, as for some strange reason that he never articulated, he was an unrepentant Tory. Yet it was Labor who afforded me the opportunity to which he was so committed. In fact, when I first got the vote, we all went to the polling booth together. Uh, he needed to monitor my behaviour. And when I came out, he asked me how, who I'd voted for. I said, Wilson and Labor, of course. He never spoke to me for a week. My mother gave me a gold badge of Lennon. Notwithstanding that I stand here today representing the Australian Labor Party, my father would have been a very proud man. My political views sharpened during my time at university, much to my father's chagrin. It was a time of marches, protests and sit-ins. Yet in spite of what, he hoped, what, what was hoped to be a sea change in British society, it remained fundamentally inegalitarian and a privileged social structure. Mr President, as you would be aware, I have always been a keen advocate of workers' rights and conditions of employment, and since 1970 have been involved in the union movement. I've been a member of the CPSU CSA for the last 16 years, the majority of that time as a delegate. Incidentally, for those members who do not know me, I was a parliamentary officer in this parliament for 15 years and was the union delegate for a number of those years. 
My research indicates that only one other parliamentary officer has entered parliament as a member, and that is the deputy leader of uh, the federal parliamentary Labor Party, Jenny Macklin, who worked as a researcher in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Library. It may amuse some to see a former staff as a member, but believe me, I have a wealth of experience and insight into the operations of this place. My political life, it seems, has come a full circle. From worker fighting for the rights of the worker to member legislating for the rights of the worker. I will never lose my proletarian agenda. Academically, as an officer of the parliament, I engage in extensive research in respect of parliamentary and governmental structures. This, of course, involved both state and federal and the interconnection between the two in matters of jurisdiction and constitutional arrangements. This brings me to express a major concern that I have with the direction our governmental system is taking. We all know that since the promulgation of the Australian Constitution, there has been a tension between states' rights and a need for an Australian federal government to act in the national interest. Both major parties have at one time or another been accused by the states of a Canberra power grab. However, I do not think that there has been a politically sophisticated articulation of Australian federalism since the Whitlam and Fraser New Federalism federalisms in the 1970s. There seems to be a lack of understanding of the complex relationship between the states and the Commonwealth. Since the 204 federal election, in an unimaginative and heavy-handed manner, the Prime Minister has once again raised the spectre of Menzies. In his address to the Menzies Research Centre on the 12th of April 2005 on federalism, he said that the goal of the federal government was to expand individual choice, freedom and opportunity, and not to expand the reach of the federal government. Menzies, in spite of the professed liberal belief in limited government, simultaneously flaunted a respect for federalism while expanding the powers and functions of the national government. That the federal nature of Australia has been undermined by the financial dominance of the Commonwealth is a fact. However, the Howard agenda is to use its financial power to force political and social policies upon the states in an unprecedented way. And contrary to the states' express wishes at the time of their agreement to federate. State sovereignty existed prior to federation, and that sovereignty was enshrined in the document that these states agreed to. It should all be, also be noted that at the time of federation, the sovereignty of Western Australia had not been subjected to participation in the Commonwealth. Indeed, Western Australia, had it not been for the free traders from the eastern states, would have remained outside the Commonwealth entirely. The federal government was allocated those tasks which the states deemed appropriate. The Howard government fails to recognise now, more than ever, that the Gallup government, as other state governments, has a very important stake in the authoritative determination of public priorities in Western Australia. Howard's political problem is that because all state governments are Labor, he has a limited capacity to implement coalition policies at the micro level. The Howard response to this political dilemma is to utilise the coercive powers that are available to him, for example, the corporation's power. This issue is not about choices and freedom. It's about coercion and social and political manipulation, which undermines the great Australian principles of egalitarianism, cooperation and a fair go. This is a repudiation of social justice for the states. No matter that individuals have repeatedly exercised their individual choice to vote in Labor governments in every state and territory of this country, no matter that those individuals made that decision because they like the state Labor government's policy ideas about how to best provide choice and opportunity for all, or at the very least that they wanted to check on the coalition government. In the Prime Minister's mind, 
there is only one philosophy with a valid claim to the lofty ideals of expanding individual choice, freedom and opportunity, and that is his own. It is increasingly, it's interesting to note that while Howard is increasingly unilateralist in his dealings with the states, the Productivity Commission's final report on national competition policy, tabled in the Federal Parliament on the 14th of April 2005, makes it quite clear that success will depend on cooperative federalism, that national coordination amongst governments will be critical to good outcomes. The Prime Minister argues that state incompetence was forcing him to reshape federalism. However, he was not given any mandate to reshape federalism in this country. Certainly, Western Australia is the economy driving the nation, but it is widely punished by the Howard government for sheer political reasons. It is assuring to me and other people on my side of politics that a bipartisan response to Howard's centralism has been adopted by the leader of the state opposition and indeed the former leader of the state opposition. Furthermore, as prominent conservative commentators point out, the Commonwealth is invading areas that one would imagine that they would not want. The centralism push is completely out of tune with 21st century realities and bucks an international trend by moving towards a centralist system when other countries, including Britain, are moving in the opposite direction. Should the Prime Minister have a referendum on the issue of increasing Commonwealth powers, I do not believe that it would succeed. Rather, while recognising the, the reluctance of the Australian polity to alter its constitutional arrangements, he seeks to bludgeon the states into acquiescence by an overt corruption of the principles of Australian federalism. Australians historically have opposed anything that remotely resembles an autocratic accumulation of power to the centre, particularly the so-called outlying states such as Western Australia. Do not forget, students of history, the secession movement was strong in the 1930s in Western Australia when a referendum on secession was passed. This attitude is still current amongst large sections of the Western Australian community and how its approach will only result in the increased alienation of the Western Australian electorate from the Commonwealth. Again, this view, I believe, is bipartisan in Western Australian politics. My concern is that those who seek to undermine the sovereignty of the states forget the constitutional history of the Commonwealth as a creature of the state's desires. Despite the ideological push of the federal government, this state, under our current Premier, will strongly resist any diminution of the capacity of this government to set its own priorities and agenda. I will, during my time in this place, articulate these views at greater length within the context of Commonwealth interference in states' rights, particularly industrial relations laws. Mr President, finally, I would like to thank various people for the support they have given me. I would particularly like to thank the Honourable Lillian Ravlich, the Honourable Shelley Archer, Kevin Reynolds, Secretary of the CFMEU, Tim Daly, Secretary of the AWU, and my sons Simon and James. I would also like to commend and pay thanks to the Honourable John Cowdell, who did a marvellous job as President of this place. He is a man of wit, intelligence and erudition. But my special thanks go to my husband David, for all his encouragement and support. He's been marvellous. And so on a final note, solidarity forever, comrades.